I'm going to take you right back out to what we're seeing now. Now these protesters are on the other side. A police officer with the Sacramento Police Department. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. that happening right now you can see the crowd dispersing but they're not leaving and I want to stress that because that's what we saw yesterday well, it started off as a relatively peaceful protest, I gotta say, and it quickly turned now, as it got darker at night, to looting. As you see here behind me, this is Kicks Unlimited on 7th Street, and this is known for selling high-end sneakers and things of that nature, supreme clothes. And as you can see, the front uh, window here busted out. All of the stuff inside is now gone. People getting away with a, with a lot of uh, uh, stuff here. This isn't the only place. Just minutes ago, we walked over to the Macy's store in Doko, and Macy's is busted out as well of uh, people going inside and outside of the Macy's there. Uh, but I do want to show you uh, what the protest was like uh, just about an hour ago as we were in front of the Sacramento County Sheriff's uh, Office. You could see there at the jail tear gas started coming in from police after protesters began throwing bottles towards the uh, towards the deputies. At that point, uh, the tear gas and rubber bullets came out, and I was standing easily about a football field away from where the tear gas was fired, and I could still uh, feel... video people began scattering away from all that uh, you also had rubber bullets being fired into the crowd too at one point uh, this let me just tell you the whole protest it started uh, there at the Capitol and quickly moved towards the highway as people were trying to go to the highway and uh, as, as we take a look now if you want to come back out here live people are making their way into the kicks unlimited here on 7th Street uh, right now as you can see people are trying to uh, go in and, and take stuff. It just, it's unfortunate. It started off as a pretty peaceful protest, I got to tell you, uh, uh, between the two sides. And once it got to the uh, Sacramento County uh, Sheriff's Office, that's when things turned a bit uh, uh, violent there. It jumped all lanes of Interstate 80. It was burning on guardrail posts, in the median, and into the dry grass on the south side of I-80 into Lagoon Valley. By 6 o'clock, an eerie sight. No traffic on Interstate 80 through Lagoon Valley in either direction. Back on the north side, when the flames calmed down, we drove up Cherry Glen Road and saw some of the toll this fire took on homes. This is where you think about the lives impacted, the families, the children who played in this yard. Almost the entire contents of a home reduced to a pile of ash. A few doors down, firefighters were on scene, staging outside homes they could save. But on one property, flames were absolutely devouring a barn. Typically, a barn on fire like this would prompt a massive response from firefighters. But again, there are so many other places where firefighters are needed, this barn would simply have to burn itself out as the Hennessy fire continues to make its own rules. What really made today frightening at times was, of course, the wind. It's one thing to be standing next to a tree that's burning or an area of grass on fire, and it's moving slowly. But this fire would make sudden, aggressive runs as the wind would pick up. And the wind was not only coming from one direction. The wind was coming from all directions, coming down the steep walls of the hillsides here, and was very unpredictable. And it's like a convection oven. When you're standing in an area in a wind-driven fire, you feel the heat at least a football field away. At least today, we could feel that heat at least a football field away from the fire. So everything ahead of the fire is going to ignite even faster and hotter when it's pushing the heat ahead of itself. And I do believe we have some video to show you of that first vehicle uh, driving through protesters. This group of protesters has uh, stopped traffic, blocked certain intersections. Right now we're near the intersection of Palm and Dudley. And you can see that they are blocking uh, Palm right now. Several cars are trying to come through. And we're hearing a lot of tension between people driving by. The protesters, there's a lot of profanity. We're trying to be as sensitive as possible about this situation. Uh, uh, but you're seeing here the moments that that first car drove through a crowd of protesters that was near the intersection of Peacekeeper and Dudley. And they were blocking that section of the roadway then. Uh, they're now blocking the roadway here now. So uh, uh, we saw also as those protesters were uh, being hit by a red truck just moments ago, uh, them hitting the truck. And now you're seeing some contention with uh, these protesters, these anti-Trump protesters 
threatening a Trump supporter, making sure he is walking away from the situation. And really, this is the environment that we have been seeing all morning out here. A decision four years in the making. This is the most important election in the history of our country. All in the hands of voters tonight. The power to change the country is not figuratively, it's literally in your hands. It's election night in America unlike any that we have ever seen before. From the race for the White House to the contest affecting your community, we have reporters covering it all. The balance of power hinging on tonight's results. Decisions that could change the landscape of local government. A record number of ballots putting pressure on election officials. Reaction from both sides of the aisle already pouring in. With polls closed and votes being counted, all eyes now on the Electoral College and the race to 270. Vox 40 is your local election headquarters. Our special election night coverage starts right now. And thanks for being with us on this election night for Fox 40 News at 10. I'm Nikki Lorenzo and I'm Eric Harriman. Tonight we have nonstop coverage of all the major races. We have six reporters out in the field, two others in the studio with us tonight, plus our political analyst, Democrat Ed Emerson and Republican Tim Rosales covering all angles from our local governments to the state capitol to the balance of power in Washington. All right, but of course we're going to start with the race for the White House. Lots of eyes on this. So this is where things are standing in terms of the electoral college votes. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Dr. King. Yeah. Yesterday, we actually had a lot of people out from the community helping with this one. Just like with blocking and girls from our housing program while Shane was doing the other. It was pretty fun. Having Shane here is quite an honor. He had done a George Floyd and Dr. King and Kobe Bryant mural. And he's like, you know, I've just been thinking about going and starting to do like a, a tour of some historical figures and some, some people of faith that, you know, did incredible things. And so my husband said, I have a wall you can come paint on. It's a motivational thing, you know. Every great dream begin, begins with a dreamer. You gotta have a dream. Yeah, you gotta have a dream. It's a beautiful thing. I love it. It's great. Thank you. You know, I definitely believe in these times there needs to be strong voices and then there needs to be quiet rebuilders who continue to rebuild places of mourning. And, you know, Dr. King is a reminder he was a voice. And then you have someone like Harriet Tubman who lived in the secret and freed slaves. And so we need both today. Very strong. We need the voices. And we need those that are just going to quietly, even secretly, get to work and see people set free. Darkness definitely feels pretty loud right now. But when darkness is loud, light shows up, you know? Welcome back. <laughs> every wave and every honk. Car after car welcomes Jim Cassis home. I never thought I'd see you again. A parade from a distance to honor the 78-year-old grandfather just out of the hospital after beating COVID-19. Hey, Chris. Hey, Sarah. Love you. Love you so much. On life support for 10 days and uh, no family. No. That's all I could think about is getting home and walking with them. Feels great. Well, it's really good to hear you're better. I was really worried. Cassis doesn't remember much from his three weeks at Sutter Medical Center, just the agonizing pain of his illness. Ran out of energy, ran out of everything, and I dug deep in my stomach and there was nothing there to give. And then I remembered Deb and I thought about the kids and I felt the power of all the prayers of people behind me. He kept fighting, and after that night, slowly but surely, started to recover. It was that one night, that one night I faced death, and, uh, and I pulled through, and it wasn't me that did it. It was all my family and my friends pulling for me and praying for me. On April 8th, doctors were able to take him off the ventilator, two years to the day after his wife Debbie had two cancerous tumors successfully removed. I've got to think there's somebody up there watching. 
Somebody up there says that's a special date for us. Okay, bye bye. Love you. And while these friends and family members are here to celebrate Jim. Hi, how you doing, sweetheart? You know you've got the best family. Oh, Dixie. He says they're the ones he wants to thank. I'll be right next week, Dennis. When my bucket was empty, they were pouring stuff into it from their hearts. And I really believe that brought me through. Thank you. In times of uncertainty, you see the fear in their eyes. These times are hard for all of us. We lean on their strength, their courage, their will. We just want to do everything that we can to, um, to live up to their trust in us. They keep people safe, help get food on the table, and lift our spirits. It's been a challenge to be quite honest with you. Everybody is working so hard over here. Tonight, we honor our heroes on the front lines and the local groups that are keeping our communities going putting the needs of so many ahead of their own. We are so grateful and we're praying for them uh, and uh, they're our heroes. A lot of people have been thanking us and that has been incredible. It's the greatest gift. Making a difference when it matters most with actions that matter. And the next 30 minutes are dedicated to the front line and essential workers who are putting the needs of others first during this pandemic. Yeah, we'll also be highlighting the local organizations that have kept our communities going. They've lifted our spirits throughout this unprecedented time. And now it is our turn to say thank you. Back to school in a pandemic. Should I be afraid? Shouldn't I be afraid? How is this going to affect my child? As parents and students across the state prepare to start a new school year in unprecedented times. Being at home with the kids and I have no idea how this is supposed to work. Teachers in both public and private schools forced to take their lessons out of the classroom and onto the computer. We are waiting on pins and needles to have the opportunity to bring our students back. But will some kids be left behind? Plus, the impact on sports. Tonight, we're tackling your concerns and answering your questions live with the state's deputy superintendent. Return to Learning starts right now. And thanks for joining us for our half hour special return to learning. I'm Nikki Lorenzo. And I'm Eric Harriman. As schools prepare to start, some of them actually started today, day one. Parents and students are faced with a growing list of questions about what learning will look like this year. Navigating the new normal statewide with tough decisions about our health. We just want to do it in a very deliberative and thoughtful way. And livelihood. Open up California now. We need to go back to work. Impacting 40 million people. We hold the powerful accountable. Getting answers to your questions from congressional leaders. Inside California politics, the road to reopening starts now. And welcome to a special edition of Inside California Politics. I am Nikki Lorenzo, live in Sacramento. Well, the U.S. has crossed a grim milestone, more than 100,000 coronavirus deaths. And tonight, congressional leaders from both sides of the aisle, they are here for a straightforward conversation on how the federal government can help us recover from this pandemic. seeking answers to problems more than 400 years in the making. Black lives matter because we're the ones being killed by the same people that would pull you over and basically write you a ticket and pull us over and we might get a gunshot. Black Americans still facing inequities, including right here in Northern California. Even when something is operating like it should, maybe especially when it's operating like it should, um, we still have disproportionate and unequal outcomes. We take a look at the complicated road that got us to this moment and what needs to be done to promote meaningful change. Thanks for joining us for a special edition of Fox 40 News Conversations for Change, Building Unity. I'm Nikki Lorenzo. And I'm Eric Harriman. Over the next hour, we're going to hear from community leaders, elected officials, law enforcement and health advocates as we explore race inequities all across Northern California. Our conversation for change this week puts a focus on educational equity, what some say is not happening for black students in California's classrooms. This is your invitation to just listen. What you're about to hear is raw and we realize you may not agree, but the hope is the more we all listen, the closer we may get to understanding each other. In today's conversation for change, we introduce you to Margaret Fortune. My name is Margaret Fortune. I am actually the daughter of educators and the granddaughter of educators. My career 
has been in public policy. Um, I went to the Harvard Kennedy School of Gov Government and got a master's in public policies. I was an advisor to two California governors on both sides of the aisle. I'm the president and CEO of Fortune School, and we're a network of nine public charter schools located in Sacramento. And the focus of our schools is to close the African-American achievement gap. You gotta look at the results. Black kids are the lowest performing subgroup in our in public schools, other than students with special needs. About 70% of black kids can't read or write at grade level. Those are the results. The reason why Fortune School exists is because a public school board, the Sacramento County Board of Education, made a finding of fact on the record that all 13 of the county's school districts have a severe and persistent African-American achievement gap, such that there is no place that a black family can go in Sacramento in the traditional public schools and not confront that. That's not just the work of Closing the African American Achievement Gap um, is actually learnable, right? So let's, so, so let's go there. We are living in a society that is very comfortable aggrandizing black people for their work ethic when it comes to practicing sports. But then when they get into a school environment, we want to soft pedal the practice. Nobody wants to go see LeBron James play basketball without looking at the score. The same is true for academics. We have to measure academic performance. And my students are incredibly competitive. High expectations, that has to do with uh, your, your belief uh, that the child that's sitting in front of you uh, is intellectually capable of meeting and exceeding all of the requirements in order to be competitively eligible for college. We don't make excuses. Uh, based on the background of kids, we don't make excuses for ourselves because, uh, because the work is hard. They have to practice. Many parents will say, well, my goodness, it's not my kindergartner's fault that they didn't show up to school. It's my fault. And to that I say, exactly. And that's why they're not getting honor roll is because of you. So bring your child to school. Now, a part of being successful in closing the, the black achievement gap is being willing to have those tough conversations and not shying away from them. I think in many school environments, our educators are afraid of the parents and they're afraid of the kids. Now, I am from and of the community and this is not my first rodeo. So I'm not remotely afraid of anybody. White students are often in environments that were created for them with them in mind, with their parents in mind. We understand the importance of, of being affirming to black people and it makes a difference to, to see um, educators that are diverse educators and that they are committed equally uh, to the child. That the black kids know that they're valued. Some people make the mistake of thinking that black people don't care about their children. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we as a community are incredibly invested in education. As a matter of fact, after slavery, the first thing that we did was form schools. My parents went to 1970s Carmichael because they um, were escaping uh, segregation in the South. I've always been a person who stood up for myself. And I certainly had to learn that early as the um, only black kid in my class you know, I will say that um, I remember being called the, the N-word at school um, and by a, a kid who was new to our elementary school. Um, and I was impressed with my white classmates um, who handled that kid on the playground. <laughs> How they defended me. Excuse me. And so when I talk about, you know, uh, school environments uh, that aren't made for black children. Uh, 1970s Carmichael was not made for black kids. <laughs> and so I consider myself to be very privileged to have this opportunity to serve African-American children in this way. I felt that sense of what it is to be an other. And I realized, you know, you, know, you realize about yourself, uh, are you fight or flight? How do you respond? 
uh, to challenge. Um, uh, I fight, and I think that that's what makes Sacramento such a special place, is that we are a community of people uh, that take action to do what's right and to do what's good. Well, congratulations to Rachel Hernandez. So this is my 19th year teaching. I'm still in my very first teaching job. County took me right out of college and I never left. Morning! I went to college and I was always interested in sign language as a child. I started researching what can I do with the deaf and I found teaching and I actually didn't really like want to be a teacher so much because I saw my mom be a teacher for my whole life from the the back end. I said I like it. Why not? Why am I being so anti-teaching? And so then I uh, decided to go for it and I've been on that track ever since. Happy Friday! I think the the biggest change between now and with COVID and school was that, that interpersonal connection. It's just not the same through a computer screen to take away their core base of where they get to be them and communicate all day and have access to language all day. And then they go into a home environment where they don't know their language 100% and they can't express themselves clearly at all times. I think that is emotionally very hard to deal with. I've chosen to work on campus to match my district peers, so the environment is the same for my students, the access is the same for my students, and I just, I still miss them so much, so even though I see them every day. Know that the parents that are struggling with work and school, that it's not easy on the teachers either, and we're struggling, we miss your kids, I miss my kids, and we'll get back. Winning, I think, is just a huge reward to even promote awareness. To my students, I love you more than you ever know. I miss you. I can't wait for you to come back and know this is hard on me too. I just try to stay positive for you at all times. And you all rock, you're awesome, and I'm so proud of everything that you're doing. A simple ask. I'm as close to speechless as possible. For a man who's given so much. This has never happened to me before. Thank you for your service, and we're glad that we could be a part of this today. Well, I want to thank you. At 104 years old, Major Bill White says it's the sentimental things that count. It's why he called on his Stockton community to send him a few Valentine's Day cards for his scrapbook collection. Little did he know the thank you notes would come from across the country and far beyond. Very proud to have met you. Yeah, very, very, very proud. proud of you. More than 300,000 handwritten messages and counting. It is amazing. From all 50 states and dozens of countries. Countries. This is something that is just hard for me to believe. His daughter Mary Houston says they've been busy sorting through every box and reading every card. Very much surprised. This was not what we expected. Very honored. Very honored and so appreciative to everyone for everything that they have have sent. Among the many letters Major White received, one was from the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Another from the U.S. Secretary of Defense, and even from the President of the United States. It represents the great honor that we feel being able to come here, visit you, and honor you for your great sacrifice. Put my you in the uniform, standing for the U.S., and we're standing for you right now, sir, so I salute you. I thank you. Thoughtful tributes, ones intended for a scrapbook, taking on a new meaning. Truly an honor to meet a hero. Summing up the legacy. You, you are a rock star. And the impact. Take your picture. <laughs> You're an inspiration. Of one United States Marine. To the shores of a Tripoli. This pandemic has created difficult and uncertain times really for everyone. And we want you to know, we here at Fox 40, we're in this with you every day. Yeah, and while things may be very, very different right now at every level, take comfort in knowing that we will get through this together. And here's how we can focus on our future.
this journey of passion and persistence finally led to this day, this day of reckoning. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, sooner or later in life, everyone sits down to a banquet of consequences. This is that day for Joseph D'Angelo. More than four decades after a crime spree that began in the Central Valley, continued here in the Sacramento area, and concluded in Southern California, Joseph D'Angelo is admitting to being the man behind it all. Thanks for joining us for Fox 40 News at 6. I'm Nikki Lorenzo. And I'm Eric Harriman. The investigation into the crimes of the Vesalia Ransacker, East Area Rapist, and the Golden State Killer came to a conclusion today at Sacramento State University in a ballroom there where D'Angelo pleaded guilty to dozens of those crimes. Today's actions saved D'Angelo from facing the death penalty, but he will very likely be spending the rest of his life behind bars. D'Angelo pleaded guilty to 13 murders, admitted to dozens of rapes. Uh, for more than six hours, prosecutors from nine counties, they laid out the details of his reign of terror, including how he bound, raped, and beat his victims. Fox 40's Rowena Shaddock sat in the hours long hearing today and spoke with some of the victims afterwards. She joins us live now from Sacramento State University with more on what happened. 